John, good to have you back again. Steve, it is always fun to be with you. Uh, you've got a new book out called uh, Code Red. Yes. Uh, hot, hot off the press. Yeah, show it up twice now. <laughs> there, there we go. Uh, Code Red, Jack Nicholson, A Few Good Men. Explain first the title, how and... Well, Jack Nicholson uh, famously felt that he had to protect America. He was in charge, and so he issued you know, his famous Code Red. Uh, and, and the line was, you need me on that wall. And uh, at the beginning of the book, I paraphrased his speech as if it were Ben Bernanke or now Janet Yellen. You need me on that committee. You want me on that central bank. Yes, you weep for savers and creditors, but I'm responsible for whole economies. Um, I have a greater thing, you know, uh, things to worry about. So, the central banks of the world in 2008 had to issue a code red. Patient comes to the hospital, put them on morphine. I mean, in one sense, it's like asking the arsonist to put out the fire. And we, we go into that. I mean, part of the reason we had those very, a very crisis was because of central bank policies and the, the regulations and the, the, the true weaving of large investment banks and politicians and central bankers. Um, I, I don't want to get into conspiracy theories. I think it's just... Uh, How about a people's self-interest? How about a stupidity theory? <laughs> some of some of it was stupid, but some of it was just greed. Yeah. Nonetheless, we had a crisis. Uh, the banking system froze up. We went to the edge of the abyss. We looked over, and it was a long way down. And I believe central banks appropriately provided liquidity. That is the function, and I would argue almost the the sole true function of a central bank is to be there. Uh, when, when, when the stuff hits the fan. Well, what the, Badgett called the lender of last resort. The lender of last resort. Uh, <clears throat> that being said, they never took the patient off morphine. I mean, at yours and my age, we've had the unpleasant experience of being with friends who uh, are in the hospital. And in today's world, I mean, my mother had a hip operation and they were having her walk the next day. I mean, they had just opened her hip up, put a new hip in, one of my good friends the same as way, and the next day they, were, they had him up and walking. Uh, forget this morphine stuff. Forget laying around like it used to. Uh, well, we're still operating in 1900 medicine as far as central banks. We've kept the patient on morphine. And now we've addicted him. And the problem is, However you want to end that addiction, whether it's alcohol or drugs or morphine or quantitative easing, it's not going to end pretty. And their hope is that somehow another we can get the economy going, we can create animal spirits, and that people won't notice when they start pulling out a trillion dollars a year of monetary easing into the central system, into the world system. You know, they even hinted that they might reduce the amount of the increase. The market's just crazy. And, you know, the next week, all the Federal Reserve governor types and, and central, oh, no, 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 that's not what we meant. We mean something different, and it's all going to be about the data. Everything's data dependent, whatever the, it's like we weren't data dependent before. Central bankers and economists serve the function of shamans. And, and evangelists and so forth. I mean, they're there to not look at sheep intervals, but they look at data and they tell us what the future is going to be by looking at the data. Now, as we talk in the several chapters of this book, the Fed economists are particularly bad at predicting the future. I mean, it's worse than if you and I just flipped a coin, okay? Um, they, it's almost statistically impossible to be as bad as central bankers are about predicting the future. And yet we're supposed to trust them that their data tells them, well, we need to apply this amount of quantitative easing and this amount of money and this interest rate level, and somehow or another it's magically gonna transform into these numbers out here that for decades 
we've been predicting and we haven't been right. So it, it doesn't end well. We have 12 men sitting in a central, in, in, well, men and women sitting in a room thinking they can manipulate economy with data they truly don't understand, with an economy they can't measure, and with tools they're making up as they go along. Is that impassioned enough, Steve? I, mean, I, get, well, you, I, uh, I, get, I get wound up, but, but it is, now, uh, it so, has uh, consequences. So you talk about central bankers gone wild. Yes. Uh, how do they avoid blame? I mean, powerful agency, unchecked, make their own money. I think at the end of the day, they're going to lose the, what I call lose the narrative. They're going to lose their ability to be the guy behind the curtain, you know, making the magic happen. Now that leads to a quick interesting subject. Why are so many people intimidated by monetary policy? I mean, in Capitol Hill, for all the stupidity there, people do master, many of them, complex subjects. What, what, what's the inhibition about monetary policy? What are they? <gasps> Steve, it's magic. Okay. It, I mean, economists would like to think. So maybe that, David Copperfield should be fed. <laughs> David Copperfield might do as good a job. Uh, economists like to think that we can create models and equations. That we have physics envy. And, and economics is part art as much as it is science. It is not, uh, it is not something that is to the level yet, maybe in the future with, you know, new systems and new theories, but we are not yet able to truly model an economy and to understand what the inputs you are. Can't model one person for crying out loud. Well, I, I have trouble modeling my seven kids and just like you were, we were talking about your daughters. Uh, it, it, it's amazingly complex. And what we do by trying to manage the ups and downs by not allowing the system to correct um, in minor ways, then we build up the potential for a very large correction. And I think... Sort of like suppressing <coughs> forest fires? Like suppressing forest fires. It's a, it's a great analogy. We use, in fact, we use it in our book. The, the, the consequence is that uh, we're now at a trillion dollars worth of, of quantitative easing a year, the Fed balance sheets at four trillion. Uh, one of my questions to Janet Yellen, we were talking about earlier, if I was on the Senate committee, would be, well, what's the theoretical limit? Is there a theoretical limit to the Federal Reserve balance sheet? Now, you and I, and most right-thinking human beings and economists would say, well, yes, there has to be a theoretical limit. Well, what is that theoretical limit? Well, when the answer becomes it's we'll data, data dependent. <laughs> we'll look at the data. <laughs> we both had this. We both knew exactly what the answer was going to be. That's not a. That's a non-answer. That's a non-answer. That's saying we won't know what the theoretical limit is until we've passed it. Well, are we going to have to get into a, a situation that looks like the '70s again? Today we get away with printing of money that we couldn't have gotten away with in the 70s because the velocity of money is slowing down. It's, it, it, well, that, 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 that leads to the amazing question. How could the Fed have created the balance sheet that it has? If anyone had looked at that five years ago, they'd have said it would be Weimar German Republic hyperinflation. Which why, many people did. Why, why, why didn't it, it is it is It is all about the velocity of money. Uh, that money hasn't moved out. It's still sitting in reserves. Why has that happened? Well, that's a good question, and I would like you to find a paper anywhere that explains Fisher's concept of the velocity of money that he gave us back in the 30s. Nobody. Louis. <laughs> well, it, here's what we know about it. It rises and it falls over long periods of time. And the velocity of money started turning down well before this last crisis from a very high level, and now it's falling and it's continuing to fall, and it will continue to fall until some moment in which it begins to rise again. And when it begins to rise, if you've got a $5 trillion, $6 trillion balance sheet and things get bad, and we get a recession, because God knows we have not figured out how to tame the business cycle, I don't care what they think they can do with targeting nominal GDP, 
then what does the Fed do? Do they give us two trillion in an era of uh, a rising velocity of money? Do they have to find Volcker to come back? I mean, this doesn't end well at some point. And now, people want to go, well, when? Can I write it out? Can I, can, when do I need to get, I, I don't know. And they don't know either. We're, this is not Tom Landry sitting on the sideline of the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, for those of us of a certain era, remember the man with the fedora. He, he had a plan. If it was third and 27 and they were down a touchdown, he had a play already planned out. That's, he had everything marked. The Federal Reserve doesn't have, they're making it up as they go along. So if you <clears throat> And if it's you're... frustrating for investors because we don't know the outcome, nor do we know what they're going to do. We, we're guessing. Now, if you were Janet Yellen, going into the Fed, knowing what you know, what would you do? If I were Janet Yellen, I'd be talking about data dependency. I would do exactly what she's going to do, which is give non-answers so that she can go back and do whatever the heck is the heck she wants to do. What would you do? How, how would you well, try to get, get us out I, of this? Mess? I would become kind of like Volcker was uh, back, back in the <laughs> 80s in that he was burned in effigy. If you remember, oh, I remember. you remember, he was not popular. There was a reason Reagan didn't reappoint him. Um, I mean, we look back now and we go, oh, Volcker was a great man. We did what had to be done. He allowed the economy to function on its own. And he said, we're not going to allow inflation to be the controlling agent. We're going to be opportun opportunistically disinflationary over time. But to start that process, he had to take the patient off the morphine. And I would not immediately end quantitative easing because God knows that could be terrible, but I would begin to taper. I would probably, contrary to some of my more uh, uh, aggressive uh, uh, fellow analyst, I would just say, ah, oh, the Fed's got a $4 trillion balance sheet, leave it alone. That's what they did in the 30s. And eventually, nobody notices it. I, 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 and if you have to start letting it taper off, then you, let, you allow it to taper off just simply by rolling over sales, and, 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 and so much of its mortgages, it'll reduce anyway. Um, and you allow rates to rise something to the more natural rate. I mean, we don't have uh, enough time, but there is this concept of the natural rate of interest. And when you artificially hold interest rates below that, that natural rate of interest, which we've done for four years now, and now with the new Fed papers, they're talking about uh, giving us forward guidance to 2017. We're talking eight years of artificially low financially uh, repressed interest rates, that is theft. And what it is, it's theft of time. Because we have a generation of people who have played the game. They've saved their money, they've done what they're supposed to, and now we're saying you're not going to get enough return unless you move out the risk curve. But you are precisely the point in time of your life when you shouldn't be taking risks. Bernanke comes on the stage and he says, We've made the stock market look good. How wonderful is that? What have we done? We have given people with assets and bankers the opportunity to make enormous amounts of money. 2009 came along. Bankers were on their back. The world was coming to an end. And who has been the most profitable since then? Bankers, because we flipped the world out to make the world good for them. Not recognizing that I want a banker to take my deposits and to lend it out and to pay me money on it. And I want him lending it into the community for productive purposes. I don't want him lending money necessarily to head, I mean, I make my money and I invest in a lot of hedge funds, but I don't want that community bank lending into hedge funds. I want it going into productive purposes. The hedge funds can find money somewhere else, thank you. They're very good at that. Um, what we need is to understand that we have stolen time from people who, that's the one thing they have. And it's a reducing, wasting asset. And when you take it from them, 
you're taking away their lifestyles. You're taking away their ability to enjoy what should have been a golden time. Now, uh, I'm all, you know, well, we'll, <laughs> uh, we'll get to uh, what, what uh, you recommend in the book, but why are economists so obsessed in terms of growth? The only way they think they can do it is by credit bubbles. They wouldn't call it that, but that's in essence what they're re reduced to. The create a credit bubble. <clears throat> the reigning a theoretical economic paradigm is is one of let's call it neo Keynesianism. I, d I don't really think Keynes would would be completely on board with it today. Um, and that is a fetish with consumption. And they want to drive consumer spending. And the way you drive consumer spending is to make money cheap so that you can buy cars at lower prices, so that you can buy other stuff. And you, in, in essence, debt is basically future consumption brought forward. And another way to say that is current spending, current borrowing today is future consumption denied when it's borrowed for consumption. Now, debt for productive purposes, debt for me to buy a robot or a tool or, or things where I can put labor into to be, produce a product, that's productive debt. But consumption debt is, is, is what, that, that leverage is what the Keynesian economic guys seem to be wanting to produce. And it does spur income and investment today, just like the housing bubble did. There was no question the housing bubble employed a lot of people. A lot of people made a lot of money, and then a lot of people lost money because they were on the wrong side of leverage. Uh, it would be more appropriate, I think, to target income. That's the important part of what an economy should be doing. How can we produce more income? How can we produce more profit? And it doesn't have to be widgets. It can be services. Facebook is a perfectly fine uh, um, uh, economic activity. It's an entrepreneurial service. It's people that it's, it allows us to do things that we will all enjoy doing. Um, there are many, many ways. I mean, restaurants. Uh, I mean, there's tons of ways to produce a service or a good that people want. But that's production, not consumption. In terms of uh, what to do, uh, I love your thing about dimes in front of a steamroller. <laughs> right. <laughs> about uh, people going on risks. Uh, you talked about... Uh, stocks. You say you shouldn't avoid stocks. You just got to know when to buy them cheap. How do you pick stocks in an environment like this? Well, you don't pick stocks by indexes. You don't say, uh, <coughs> you don't do the risk on, risk off thing. Uh, what does an investor have? An investor now, not a trader. An investor has time. And what you should look at is, how do I get the most value for the time I'm going to sell? Uh, if I came to you today, Steve, and said, I'd like to hire you, uh, and you know, minimum wage is seven seventy-five an hour, and I'd like you to go work for me seven seventy-five an hour, you just laugh at me, because you think your time is more valuable than that. But so many investors today sell their time at minimum wage. That's what they do, in essence. They sell their investments at minimum wage because they want the certainty of it and they don't, they, they don't realize that their time is valuable. And that time value of money. So when you're looking at an investment, at a stock, at an equity, you say, how much income is this business likely to produce over time? And what percentage of that income, when I invest, can I get? How much of that will accrue to me? What is that going to do to the value of my act, this activity? Uh, there are lots of businesses that are valued, I believe, inappropriately. Or they have values that I find attractive over time. And it's 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 classic value investing. I mean, it's it's ben been Graham. Ben Graham. I mean, it's <laughs> it's not like uh, it's just some new revelation. Uh, but there uh, there are businesses that have franchises that are special. 
And they produce, an, uh, they're growing, and they, they produce a dividend, they give you a return on your money. Uh, we also need to recognize there are times when businesses are not attractively valued. I mean, if you look at the general stock market today, and as we show in the book, and you project uh, 10 years forward based on you know, just some normal averages, that tells you your, your potential return on stocks is anywhere from you know, uh, 2 to 4%, and there have been periods in that mo those models when returns were negative. I mean, it, it, we, we always tell investors to invest for the long run, but, but that is really terrible, bad advice. You should invest for value. Sometimes investing for the long run, if you're just talking about buying indexes, will give you negative returns for 20 years. You've been able to invest. There are periods of time when investing in the, the, the S&P gives you negative returns after, after 20 years. And I would suggest for most people, 20 years is the long run. We have, we have sold investors the convenience of the salesman rather than the return of their investment. It's a whole lot more difficult to pick stocks, to uh, allocate properly, to find value than it is saying, we want to be in the stock market for the long run because look at this model that Schiller produced and yada 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 and we've got all no. I mean, I was writing about this in '98, '99. We're st uh, we had a secular bear market started. People were saying, "Oh, John, you're so bearish." Uh, well, that's what a cycle does. This cycle, by the way, is now 14 years uh, old. It's starting to get long in the tooth. This cycle will be over and we'll be able to go back to relative value investing. But in the meantime, you have to go back to absolute return investing and recognize that it's just a different style. I'm, I will lose half my readers or some number the day that I turn bullish. And I will turn bullish uh, because we will get to a place where the market in general will turn. That it, it, it always happens. These are long cycles, average about 17 years. Uh, this one could end any time now. Um, it won't end at the levels that it is today. We've probably got one more good correction, good one more good valuation correction uh, in our future. But it does. Now, in the meantime, there are other places to go. Not every stock is valued the same. Some, there are places in the world today where you can find stocks that are global in nature with price to earnings valuations of four. Now, the company's headquartered in Greece. Oops, do I want to, you know, but, but that's, see, that's where investors have to go, let's think, is, is you know, yeah. are these companies going to go put away? Put emotions aside. Put, a, put emotions aside and, 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 and begin to think. There are ways, and I was writing about it five years ago and it's really starting to happen, you're, we're starting to see the rise of private credit. And so rather than going to a company and selling your time cheaply, there are managers who will come and say, we're going to, if you will lock your money up for a while, we're going to be able to give you an excess of what you would get from a single bond by spreading your, it's old fashioned banking, but it's done on a private side. There are opportunities out there they're not traditional opportunities, and it's not easy for brokers and advisors to sell to someone, but they're there. And we have to now, uh, in 2013, looking at our, another year for you and me, uh, we have to figure out how to restructure our thought process of how we want to manage the time value in our money. Where do people find what they should invest in? <laughs> Oh, you go to Forbes.com. Uh, I'm waiting for your .com. <laughs> <laughs> well, you go to MaldenEconomics.com. Um, by, by, by the way, uh, in your book you talk about commodities. Right. At a great run. You think uh, that's talking about tapering. I, I, I think commodities are probably getting close to uh, a cycle end, um, and so that cycle will, will change and we'll have to wait for a while. Now that doesn't, 
mean that you can, uh, there aren't ways to play commodities. Uh, now, and rather than being just long a commodity index, you might want to find managed, uh, com managed commodities, managed traders who can be long and short, uh, and, and take advantage of the other side of the cycle. So there's ways to, to and, and I personally think that that's a very good way to uh, allocate a portion of your portfolio to people who've demonstrated an ability to uh, manage the cycles. Now, uh, you say one exception is gold. And uh, you talk about uh, pricing of gold, real interest uh, versus the price, the Gibson paradox. Can you explain that? It, it, not in less than 10 minutes, but I believe gold is insurance. It's central bank insurance. Like it's fire insurance. It's, I buy fire insurance, I have health insurance, I hope I never use them. I'm particularly aggressively working, never have to use my life insurance, although I have it. And I hope I never use my gold insurance. But uh, I, I, I do have some, I buy some every month. Uh, I'm getting ready to establish an account. I, I now have five grandchildren, you're, you're working on catching up, I understand. Uh, but uh, I have, have found a place where I can buy a small amount of gold for them every month. Uh, it'll be stored outside of the United States. Uh, and these are, my, my grandchildren are from six months to you know, four years. So I can buy that same amount of gold, put it into <coughs> account for them. And when they get to a place where they can use it for... I'm not certain what education will be in 20 years. Um, I think it will be significantly different than it is today. But uh, when they get to that launching pad, uh, I believe that gold will have more of a store of value of money in 20 years than putting $100 in a month into a savings account that is not going to be able to access anything but low interest rate regimes for a long time. Now, I honestly might change my mind in 10 years and say, ah, oh, the world's changed. I'd rather put it in something else. But today, I think when I think about 20 years and I want to make sure that my children have something outside of the United States in a neutral uh, facility, that I can move in a heartbeat to another neutral facility if I were be beginning to notice things change. Yeah, I think I, I, g gold has its usefulness. The point in your, uh, in your book is that when real interest rates are severely suppressed, uh, that's when uh, gold moves up. Yes, and, <clears throat> and we have a real potential for severe uh, repression of interest rates. Uh, looking at the latest economist uh, papers from the, you know, that were written by members of the, the Federal Reserve Economics team, I, I, I don't think things change under Janet Yellen. So I think we get financial repression and we're going to see savers and retirees screwed I mean, we talk about the problems that pension funds face. Average 60-40 portfolios, you know, 40% bonds, 60 stocks, they're required to get something close to 9 to 10, maybe 11% out of their equity portfolios from today's valuations because their bond fixed income portfolio portion, that 40%, is so low. Can't be done. And yet, they're so dependent upon that data and that, that trend reverting because the bulk of the money that's going into those pension funds is not the, the for, that's going to be, need to be there for 30 years, is not the money that's being put in by the retirees. It's, it's the growth on that money. And if the growth on that money is not, is not there, the retirement pension that the person has thought he was getting is not going to be there. This, this doesn't end well, and it's 
it is a result of the financial repression that central banks are producing, not just in the U.S., in England, in Europe. So, so the oh. bottom line is when we had the crisis in 08, 09, the cure was worse than or just as bad as the disease. The cure, the cure at the time was appropriate. <laughs> but you don't keep the patient on the morphine. You, you, you get through the crisis, and when we were through the crisis, you have to let the patient stand up and work on its own. Figure it out. You're going to have a little pain. Get up and walk, damn it. <laughs> you know? Well, buy code red, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Thank you, John. Thank you.